The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 799 for Monday, January 27th, 2020. <laughs> And welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the last of our 700 series of shows, only because we don't have any more numbers left unless we go outside of the integer realm. And there's no reason to do that because we have more numbers past 799 that we can use. So it's all good. Uh, you know, we're the show where you send in your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, and we have geeky conversations about it. But the goal is... For everyone to learn at least five new things every single time we get together. So we try and make this stuff understandable and fun and interesting and helpful. That's really the goal. And of course, we all get to learn stuff. You do, of course, but hopefully that's why you choose to listen. But we do as well. It's really quite it's quite the thing. Sponsors for this episode include linode.com slash MGG, maxsales.com, expressvpn.com slash MGG, and clearme.com slash macgeekgab. I know it's a different URL. It's fine. It's good. It's just tough. Better to go to macgeekgab.com and just click on them there, and then you're good to go. All right. We'll talk about all of those a little more, little more detail, a little more depth later. But for now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. There we are, Mr. John F. Braun. I'm going to dive right into it because Ari's got, we've got quick, we have so much stuff to go through today. It's ridiculous. Ari says, I just learned today that you can drag and drop a Memoji onto any text or photo and essentially make it a Memoji sticker. Uh, So you would, uh, this is on your iPhone. You would, uh, you know, pull up the little, you tap the little Memoji app in, in the above the keyboard thing there. Then it shows you all your Memojis, assuming you've created one. If you haven't, you can right there. And then instead of just tapping it at, which would put it sort of in the area where you would type, if you just push on it and hold on it rather and drag it up, you can leave it on top of a prior message that somebody else or you typed and it will show up for everybody in the chat trail right there in the message, which is really kind of handy. And, you know, I mean, handy in the way of you know, being able to add some personality to your, uh, you know, to your iMessages. So thanks for sharing that. Ari. I don't think I knew that. Um, I've certainly done stickers before, which is what those essentially are, but I'd never realized you could do it with emojis. And what's cool is, uh, you can put once you get it to where you want, you can put a second finger down and zoom out or spin it, too. So you can really get kind of creative with it, which is fun. And of course, yeah, but to be clear, Memojis is, is is something you can only do on iOS and on. Yes, that's right. On iOS. That's correct. Correct. You can see them on Mac OS. Um, and I think, can you then manipulate them? Can you copy and paste them? Yeah. I, yes. Tip about you, you, you're right. No. One of our listeners copied, uh, put all of his emojis into like the keyboard, you know, to, or the text field there, copied them, pasted them into a note that was then synced across iCloud and then had them on um, on Mac OS. You're absolutely right. That was nice. Nice callback there. That's good. All right. Well, Donna has two quick tips, both about the watch. The first one is. um if you uh, if you go into control center on your watch, which is swiping up from the bottom, you can see all the, the, the there's a bunch of things that you get to see. If you've never done that on your watch, you can turn off um, Wi-Fi cellular. If you have it, you can see battery percentage and, and there's a bunch of other things that you can do, too. But one thing that I never realized about control center is that you can rearrange it's content. So you swipe up into it, scrolls and, uh, to get to the bottom of that sort of screen slash list and then tap edit and the buttons start jiggling. Now you know what to do. Touch and hold and drag. And when you're done, you either tap done or you press the digital crown in and that sort of locks it all in together. So that I found exciting because I, you know, that's interesting. I had no idea. You could rearrange those. I always kind of maybe in older versions of watch OS, you couldn't, I don't know, 
I've never tried, so I certainly didn't find it in watchOS 5. I don't know if it was there in prior versions, so it's a good one. Thank you, Donna. And uh, and her second quick tip is very much related to this. One of the things that you can do in um, in Control Center on the watch is that you can ping your iPhone, which is really handy. That I've definitely used in the past because... Uh, you know, if you can't find your phone, it's great. You just swipe up, do the thing. Your phone makes a noise. Even if it's muted, it'll make a noise because it's your phone and it's your watch and it's all tied together. However, what I did not know was that the little icon, the, the icon to make a noise on your phone has like a, a picture of an iPhone with with like s- s- sound waves emanating off the side of it. Uh, looks like sideways Wi-Fi icons if you, if the sound wave thing doesn't make sense to you, but um, or doesn't resonate. But um what Apple Apple has a support doc that we'll link to, and it says you can play a sound if you can't find your iPhone, or if you don't want to make a noise, touch and hold that little icon on your watch to flash your iPhone's light without making a noise. So if it's so in the bedroom and maybe your partner's sleeping or something, and you don't want to make a big lot of noise, just hold it down; it'll flash the light and. You can find it without uh, without waking anybody up unless it happens to be aimed like right at them. And then maybe that would wake them up. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I can't help with everything. So thanks for both of those, Donna. That's those are great tips. I, I, now I now I got to go and like rearrange stuff on my watch. I like it. I'm minor, minorly annoyed because you would think that you could flash the light in general, like if you did an iCloud because I went to iCloud and used, you know, find your thing. And I'm like, you know, we'll play a sound on my iPhone. I'm like, well, why can't I through that interface flash the light? That should be able to. You know what I'm saying? I do. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's only locally to it with the watch. That so it's only that. with the watch and the iPhone that it's married to or that's bonded with or whatever. Correct. And I'm looking here. I know that there is, while we're talking about flashing the light, um, if you go in iOS 13, this has been there for a while, but this is the path to get there in iOS 13. So if you're running an older version of iOS, you, you can still probably do this, but you can have the light flash for uh, notifications. If you want to go oh, in, right. go into settings, accessibility, um, go to audio slash visual, which is in the hearing section. And then at the bottom of that list is in the visual section is LED flash for alerts. So that can be a handy thing if, say, you're a podcaster and for some reason while you're podcasting, you want to know that you have an alert on your phone, but you don't want it to make a noise or, or anything. I don't I actually don't want that. That This particular podcaster would not mm-hmm. care for that. So <laughs> but but others might. I don't know. Or for others. But it could be, yeah, but it could be better than because. I don't know, like many, but I almost always have the sound off on my phone and I rely on it buzzing. But buzzing is a pretty distinctive sound and you may not want that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it makes you may prefer a LED flash versus the thing buzzing and and somebody knowing that your device is buzzing. To be fair, I I, it's worth testing, but I'm pretty sure that turning this on does not turn off the buzz the buzz will still happen the beep will still happen so if you want it not to buzz then you need to go into sounds and turn that off (sighs) just just so you know that just to you know kind of bring that full circle um we had a comment uh, where we had discussion in the last episode and about um about installing ethernet and i want to i want to share ken's tip in fact we have a bunch more tips but the um The first thing I want to do is talk about our first sponsor, which is Otherworld Computing. You know, I mean, we always say that Otherworld Computing is one of our favorite companies, and it truly is the first company that I go to anytime that I need to upgrade, uh, add anything to my Macs because they have that stuff and they know how it all works. Well, you know, they've got, they're always doing new stuff. Their new Mercury Elite Pro Dock is like the perfect combination of docking solutions and storage, right? It's got two bays for for drives that you can put in there. So there's your storage, right? And seven ports, right? So it's got two Thunderbolt 3 ports, a gigabit Ethernet port. It's got a front side SD card reader, 
Uh, it's got a display port 1.2 for adding a, up to a 4K monitor, two USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports, right? And it's also got a hardware RAID controller in there. Or you don't have to use the hardware RAID controller if you want to let it happen via software. But I talked to Larry about this. In fact, uh, I interviewed him and he he walked us through this thing. So I'll put a link to that uh, as well so that you can see this thing. But they said that that hardware RAID in these in these two bay units actually makes a lot of sense. So um, and it, it can fit two and a half inch or three and a half inch SATA drives in that thing. And it starts at two ninety nine ninety nine. So you get like your Thunderbolt three dock. And some storage, you get to your desk, you plug in your new machine, you're good to go. And, uh, and, and I, and I'm, I, I'm pretty sure it passes power to, uh, is, uh, is, I think is what he, what he told us as well. So you got to check this out, go to Mac sales.com or go to Mac and we get a link directly to the, um, OWC Mercury elite pro right there on the sponsor section. So you won't miss it. And our thanks to Otherworld Computing for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor for today is Linode at linode.com slash MGG. I will tell you, you are going to need a server someday. It's just how it works. It's, it's just how it works. And Linode understands how it works because they know, like we learned years ago here on Mac Ecab, we all learned that having an SSD in your Mac made a huge performance difference, right? Didn't matter as much about the CPU and the RAM. What mattered is moving from rotational drives to SSDs. Linode runs all of their servers, the low CPU ones, the high CPU ones, all on SSDs, everything native SSD storage. And what does that mean? You get a really responsive server without necessarily having to buy the top of the, you know, the most expensive one. Now, you might need the CPU and RAM that the most expensive ones come with or something in between, but the lowest cost one for five bucks a month, they call it a nanode. And that too runs off of SSDs. And if you like the terminal, you can SSH in and go nuts on Linode servers. And I have, and it's fun, but if that's not fun for you, then you don't have to worry about it because their cloud manager lets you set up your server and manage your server without ever even knowing how to get to the command line. You can configure it to spin up a WordPress server, a Minecraft server, a VPN server, really anything that you could think of. They've probably got it set to go. There's just, there's just tons of these options out there. My guess is if you come up with something that they haven't set up already for you, shoot them a note. They might just build it because if you want it, chances are somebody else does too. So you got to check this out. And the cool part is they've given you a $20 credit just for being a Mac Geek Gab user free out of the gate, which means you get four months of a nanode to play with for no cost. I know linode.com slash MGG is where you've got to go in order to get that $20 credit. And our thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, moving on to Ken here because Ken, I loved it. We talked about how important it was in the last episode to add uh, ethernet when you have your walls open and Ken writes as a semi geek, some of what transpires on Mac geek have sales right over my head, but every once in a while, I actually feel that I can contribute. And in last episode, 798, uh, discussing whether to install cat six, a or cat seven cable while the walls of a house are open says, I've got something to add. Of course, he says, I must give credit where it's due, namely to Leo Laporte, who has dealt with this subject many times on his Tech Guy show. He will also recommend the installation of cable while the walls are open. But even more importantly, he has also suggested installing Conduit, which makes updating or replacing that cable much easier in future years. And that is so true. I haven't priced out the difference between, you know, well, I mean, I guess you'd run cable anyway. So, um, so you'd run conduit, but you always want to, if you're going to run conduit and, and I don't know what that would cost, but my guess is there's way cheaper to do with the walls open than with the walls closed sort of by definition. Uh, when you run conduit, you want to make sure you run string in there so that you can pull new cable through any time you, um, you know, you, you want to, right. It, having the conduit there is great, but once the walls are closed, it's, it's sort of difficult to get cable all the way through it unless you have something that can pull it through and string is, is, um, is, is generally what, uh, what is used in those scenarios. So, Oh, there you go. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I remember a tip a long time ago. Remember ba- at home? I, uh-huh. st- I, I used to have them as a cable service and I think it was lore associated with them. But when they had the right of way to run their fiber, I think, backbone yeah. to do what they wanted, they were like, hey, you know, if we got the right of way along, you know, wherever, why don't we run like two conduits? <laughs> Like we'll yeah. put the stuff that's serving our current needs in one conduit, and hey, if we ever expand, we got another conduit. So uh, that that so that I mean that's great for a, a a you know infrastructure installation. I'm not sure I would recommend running two conduits in your house. I think, um, I think one would be enough. I mean, you, you know, you're going to uh, be able to fit a lot of different cables in in even a you know half inch piece. Oh of no, conduit. I get you. You know what? Yeah, I'm saying? especially so. in the age now of you know, 10 gig, right. 10 gigabit Correct. lines. Correct. That should be enough for, but hey, maybe not, you know, maybe you can, well, but you can run, running a I data mean, center. Several pieces of cat seven through, like I said, even just through half inch or, you know, three quarter inch conduit. So I think you'd probably be okay, but who knows? I don't know. I don't know. You want right. to take us to Allison, John? Uh, yeah, I guess, you know, okay. cool. We just saw her, but <laughs> yes. Um, so Allison had a comment here and she said, Hey guys, I heard a cool stuff found about tracking devices, battery status from Fidel.io for Mac or batteries for Mac. Yeah. It was a cool stuff found in a recent episode. That's right. Yeah. And we sent him a note and said, you know, somebody mentioned it and, uh, and she said, sounds cool. Installed it, but then it asked for permissions to watch keystrokes from any app. And her evidence is as follows. If you go into security and privacy in the privacy tab, under input monitoring, it showed batteries. And here's where I think the problem is, is that the text in this says, allow the apps below to monitor input from your keyboard, even when using other apps. And I think that's not entirely correct. And I'll tell you why in a moment here. Okay. So, um, you know, I thought, you know, I'd write them, you know, because that does sound kind of weird. I mean, why would you need to monitor keyboard? Why would you want to do that? So I said, uh, Ronnie, I think it is R O N Y. Yeah. One of our listeners told us about batteries for Mac. Another listener decided to try it and was wondering why he needs privacy input monitoring. And his answer is as follows. Um, the app only asks for privacy input monitoring when you enable touch bar support so that it reacts to a long tap of control Tilda, which is uh, uh, control sh- carrot, not not carrot. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. No, you're right. Yeah, which is shift six uh, to display battery levels on the touch bar. OK, so, so that makes sense. Uh, so, it well, would- technically, I think he is monitoring the keyboard, but I think it's also offering permission. And this is why I think it sounds kind of weird is that he's actually kind of writing to the keyboard or the touch bar. Right. <laughs> uh, no, I think. I, well, yes, he is writing to the touch bar, but but he doesn't need keyboard uh, monitoring for that. What he needs keyboard monitoring for is so that when you hold down control, oh, right. uh, control carrot, it knows it can see that regardless of what app you're in. Right. If you want to see battery levels on the touch bar, then, you know, the way the app works is no matter where you are on the system, you hold down control carrot and hold it down long enough and it shows it to you. Well, in order for this batteries app to know that you've held down control carrot long enough, it must be able to see the keyboard. And that's where this goes. But Allison's totally right that in theory, Ronnie or, you know, any other app developer that asked for this support could look at a hundred percent of what you type on the keyboard. And because in fact, it sort of does. I mean, it, it's not logging it if uh, presumably, but it is waiting to see that. Yeah, I've you know, the key that key is held down. OK, great. You know, it doesn't get to there's no way with the OS, at least not that I know of to register and say, hey, let the OS tell me when just this particular key combination is held down. You don't get to do that. So you got to watch for 100 percent of it. It's similar to how text expander works and others like it. That, you know, if you're looking for a certain keystroke to invoke some magic function, well, you got to be able to see everything. And and that that is just a function of the way that works. So, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And here's the weird thing, though, is that the screenshot that she sent, the other app listed there, which I don't have listed on any of my machines, is Discord. Mm-hmm. 
So I'm like, why would Discord need universal, like all the time keyboard access unless there's some secrets that. No, Discord, it, you can turn on like a system wide. So Discord is a, a chat app, John, and I happen to use it for our mm-hmm. Mac Geek Gab audio so that the audio you're hearing from John is actually coming to me via Discord. He's hearing me also via Discord and then I'm recording it. Uh, but he um, but it, it is possible to set up system wide keyboard shortcuts for Discord to turn, say, mute on and off so that you don't have to bring Discord to the front and then tell it to mute. It doesn't matter what app you're in. You hit the magic keystroke and then boom, Skype did the same thing. So if that makes sense, if you start to set that stuff up that it would need again, need system wide keyboard access in order to respond to whatever its magic keystroke is. OK. All right. And then on both my machines, LastPass is listed. And that that's kind of an obvious one, I think, because. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's not necessarily obvious. Again, if you don't use a system wide shortcut to invoke your password manager, then you wouldn't need that. But most of us do when we have a password manager use that. Right. So I think that's I think that's where that where that goes, I think. So. So I guess the message is it's good to be cautious and I guess you have to trust that the developer doesn't have, you know, <laughs> they're not going to do bad things with your data. You totally Because that's a, that's, a, that's a topic these days, you know, people absolutely taking data when they shouldn't. So it, it, at the very least, Catalina and, you know, prior Mac OS versions uh, right. let you know. It, it may be annoying at times, but it's... a you know, it's probably better to know too much than too little, right? I think so. Yeah. But it, but I mean, you know, Allison brings up a good point. That these kinds of things are not entirely obvious um, to, you know, to why they're asking for this sort of thing. And, and you know, that's up to the app developer to sort of better communicate that perhaps, I think, in the, you know, when you first launch the app saying, hey, here's the thing. You're about to be asked for permission for this. Here's why. And feel free to decline, but know that if you decline, you won't get this particular functionality or, you know, whatever, Con- some right. context sensitive thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Where I've seen that a lot is more with full disk access in that basically the utilities are like, well, if you don't enable this, then I'm not going to work. Right. I'm not going to work. It's like, yeah. OK. <laughs> the same kind of thing. Yeah. All right. Um, Kurt has a, a, a another tip for us. Kurt says, um. I stumbled onto a nifty little gem. I keep a copy of my application folder in the doc, which I think is no longer a default. However, if you click on the application folder in the doc, it will present you with an array of icons for the applications as expected. The tip hover over one of the application icons you're interested in and don't click instead tap the space bar and you'll get a little sub window pop up with information about the app, such as version, size, last modified, kind of like, he says, a quick look for apps. And it's true. You can actually get that information for any folder that you have in the doc. Like if you've got your downloads folder, you can do the same thing. Go ahead and click on it, float your mouse over something and uh, and then hit the space bar and you'll start seeing. I mean, if it's like a PDF, you'll just see it. So it really is quick look. But if it's an application, then, yeah, you'll start getting some interesting data about the uh, about the app itself. So, yeah, I kind of like that. I hadn't I hadn't really it, it, even with the downloads folder, that can be really handy to kind of looking at something and say, wait, what is that? Uh, no, that's not what I want. You know, kind of move around. So yeah, that's pretty good. Actually, I'm, I might have to integrate this to my. I might need to teach my fingers how to do this, so to speak. You know what I mean? All right, John. Uh, Mike found Mike. Mike went through a very interesting thing trying to get his old printer onto his new network, and he found man one of these things that if if only he had known at the beginning, but he knew at the end, it wouldn't cause him to tear his hair out. So, what did he learn, John? So here's what he uh, started off with. So his network consisted of the uh, Xfinity Comcast router, which I believe uh, offers uh, wireless and I think four Ethernet ports. I think my parents have the same one. And you've probably seen it as well. So that's their standard offering. So here was his initial setup. So he got that. And then he also had a, uh, a time capsule. So in this configuration, he potentially has two routers. 
And I think that's important to this problem, but maybe not. But then here's what happened. But then he decided, because Dave and I love them, uh, he decided to get an arrow. It's like, okay, good idea. So um, he got the arrow, and I guess he plugged the arrow into the Xfinity router, which I assume is his primary router, handing that's out correct. the addresses and I think, all, doing I think all his, that stuff. I think his time capsule was just acting as uh, in bridge mode as a time capsule, not not a router. Yes. So then here's what he did. So I think because he had the um, printer plugged into the um, the Xfinity router, when he plugged the Eero into the Xfinity, he then plugged the printer into the Eero, expecting it should work. And that doesn't sound unreasonable. <laughs> right. Yeah, fair. Yeah. But it didn't. And so then we're like scratching our heads. It's like, oh, now, well, why isn't it seeing it? And he called Eero and they tried to figure it out and he just wasn't getting any success. And that's when he wrote us. Right. And yes. And 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 was under the and I totally understand why. But he was under the assumption that the Eero and the printer were incompatible with one another because the printer was working fine until he added the Eero. So. This logic makes perfect sense, except that John and I know full well there's so little chance that a printer plugged in via Ethernet would have anything to do with his. It, it, there's no like it would be so difficult for Eero to have built a system that could be incompatible with that. And we've never heard of anything like it. So we kept pushing him and he finally figured it out. John, tell him right out. Now you led him down one path. You were like, well, okay, can you ping it? Which ping is a, you can use various utilities and it basically uh, asks the device, Hey, are you there now? Of course you need a way to see what is there. And I think this is where the problem kind of started or ended because I made a, 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 a observation that led him to the path to success here. So the um, Xfinity router has something similar. It has a uh, part of the interface lets you see the devices that are, that are connected to it, wired or wireless. And, you know, he sent us a screenshot and, and I saw one and I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. Um, so it showed one device, which we thought was the printer, but we weren't quite sure. And you were like, well, ping it. And he was able to ping it. And it's like, oh, that must be the printer. So what's wrong? Here's what I think happened, as it turns out, Dave. So in addition to listing the IP address of this device, which was 10 dot something something, um, it also showed the MAC address of it. There is a database, and we'll link to one of them because I sent it to him. The MAC address of something is the physical hardware address. Every device has a unique 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 character hexadecimal MAC address, which should be unique in all the world, believe it or not. The first six digits of this indicate the vendor of the product. So there's a registry of this. So if you type in the first six digits and it's like an Apple computer, it'll say, hey, it's, it's from Apple if you go to one of these databases. So I went to the device that he thought was the printer and it came back to a company that doesn't make printers. <laughs> um, and this led him down the path to conclude that that was not in fact the device. So then he went to his brother printer and for whatever reason he had at one point set it up with a static IP address. And my guess is that the static IP address was incompatible with the subnet that the Eero had established yeah, if it was on a different subnet it's on a different subnet yeah exactly exactly yeah and if it's on a different subnet um unless you have some rules somewhere saying you know go from here to there it's not going to see it so right. the solution to the problem was that he, through whatever interface the brother printer offered once he changed it to dhcp instead of a static ip address everything worked great yeah yeah for sure yeah. So, so, so he, in my case, so in my case though, Dave, my, th though using a static IP address isn't necessarily a bad thing because my aging laser printer, I actually do have a static IP address on it, but number one, because it, it believe it or not, doesn't have DHCP, but number two, I know the subnet that it's on so I can give it a unique address that doesn't conflict or, or doesn't route. Right. Yeah. It, it, that's weird that your printer doesn't support DHCP. That's bizarre. 
Wow. Yeah. The the only thing. Yeah. The, I mean, dude, this is like a 15 year old. Yeah, I know. But 15 years ago, printer. DHCP was was, you know, I mean, very common mm-hmm. to, to use. Uh, so here here's the thing. You know, he added this this router to it, thought the router was incompatible. But really, the issue was that his printer had, was forcing its own IP address on a different subnet. And this is why using DHCP is so handy and and why using static IPs can be uh, even if you know what you're doing and know why you're doing it and and perhaps better said instead of know what you're doing remember what you did because you might know what you're doing but if you don't remember what you did then it's less valuable but um except for scenarios like like yours which i would put a big asterisk on where you have a device that doesn't support dhcp my advice is if you want something to have a fixed ip address do it in the router as an IP reservation and let the device ask the router for an IP address, which is what DHCP does. And that way, if it moves to a new router, like it did in this scenario, you don't have to worry about it. You know, we had a server years ago that ran headless, you know, and as it, you know, which was fine. We would connect to it via uh, remote access or whatever. And it, and I ran it with a fixed IP address because I wanted to know where it always, where it was on the network at all times, but I set it manually on the device. And then we had a power outage and I needed to get that server up and running. So I took it to someone else's network. And when I plugged it in, I still couldn't get to it because it didn't have a local IP address there. Now, what I had to do was bring my laptop over, set my laptop to that same IP range, get into it and tell it, yeah, go get an IP from the local router. And then it could come online and get on the Internet and do all the things that the server needed to do in a different place. And it was at that moment that I decided no more static IP addresses. Everything comes from the router. And if I want something to be fixed, I reserve it in the router and we're good to go. So, yeah, good lessons. Right. And, and you're correct, but because from what I saw, um, both the Comcast um, device and, of course, Eero both support DHCP reservations. Right. So, right. So that's what you want to do for the long term. So this doesn't happen to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Moving on to some cool stuff found here. Uh, we'll go to Ben because Ben brings us to a good one here. He says, uh, hearing you talk in the last episode about the audio engine 512 speaker, I wanted to share the portable speaker I've been using for almost five years from Fugu. They have Bluetooth 4 and an aux jack up to 40 hour battery life and six or eight speakers inside. They also have Bluetooth LE for a wireless remote, a mic and speakerphone for mobile assistant and phone call support and app decks, which is a uh, high quality Bluetooth codec for higher quality audio than you might get by default, at least from older Bluetooth stuff. Finally, he says they're IP67 waterproof and the XL model can serve as a power bank with up to one amp of charging. The standard model runs around 120. It's a little smaller than that audio engine 512 you mentioned last week and weighs under a pound and a half. The XL model runs 170, is quite a bit larger and weighs over three pounds. And it's at Fugu, F-U-G, I might be pronouncing it wrong, but it's F-U-G-O-O dot com. And um, I feel like we've run into these guys over the years, John. I've certainly seen these somewhere. I want to say it was probably at one of our press events or whatever. And it they look pretty rugged. Um, they say protected against mud, snow, water, and shock. So... Pretty cool. Thank you for that, Ben. It's always good to find. I I find it really handy to have a Bluetooth speaker in each of our cars because that way when you find yourself at like the beach or somewhere, you know, in the summer or anytime, really, you know, you've always got one with you. And and these batteries tend to stay charged, you know, for a while uh, on their own. So if you just leave it in there and it's like, oh, yeah, no, I got a speaker. It's right here and you're good to go. And then then take it inside maybe and charge it up when you're done. So. Thank you for that. Good stuff. Um, thoughts on that before we move on to the next one, John? No, no, okay. not a big Bluetooth speaker guy. I yeah. Know. Yeah. Maybe someday. Maybe. All right. Um, a different band, I believe. Uh, also from episode 798, uh, we were talking about the uh, the question where someone wanted to 
create a, a text file or comma separated file of all of the email addresses in a uh, in, in a mailbox. And Ben has a different solution. Uh, we suggested using an app that you can take the messages and and drag them into and have it extract them. And I think it was called Mail Extractor. It's in the show notes for the last episode. Well, Ben thought of a different way. He says, I would first dis- disable all contacts accounts for syncing, meaning forcing the, the local contacts app um, to re-enable the on my Mac account and to inv- avoid confusion with existing contacts lists. Okay, so we're... Forcing contacts to be using something on my Mac. Then he says in mail, select a group of emails whose addresses you want to extract and choose add to senders from the message menu and then use an app called a B to CSV to export the contacts from your contacts app to a CSV file. It's a 99 cent app. And, uh, and this is interesting, right? Cause it, basically leverages all the capabilities of the Mac to get this stuff into a contacts database. And then this can spit them out into a form that, uh, that you might want for importing into, you know, like a MailChimp or something like that. So I like that. I like that different approach. It's totally the opposite direction, which is great. So, hmm. Yeah, I know. It's pretty good, right? Yeah. yeah. Pretty good. Uh, also last episode, we were talking about, tracking planes in the sky and i couldn't for the life of me remember what app it was that i had used to do this in the past thankfully let's see bill john df alan jeff i think there were two jeffs uh many of you sent in emails saying dave it's called flight radar 24 and it is it's called flight radar 24 uh that's the app so that's in cool stuff found for links this week it's available for free uh, on iOS, and there, I think there are some in-app purchases and stuff, but you can point the iPhone at a plane to find out what plane it is and where it's going using uh, augmented reality, which I think is super cool. So if you don't have that on your phone yet, put it on your phone. It's fun. Pretty good, huh, John? No. Oh my gosh, I actually have it installed on my phone. I huh. know. We both put it on our phone years ago. I just couldn't remember what it was. So Oh, I didn't know that, but... Yeah, I guess we didn't know they had an AR thing. No, I did that? know. That's what I was saying last episode. Oh. I just couldn't remember the name of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's pretty good. We got to see Pilot Pete in that app. So, a number of years ago. Okay. So, thank you for everybody for that. Uh, listener David has hipped us to something that I had no idea about. He says, um, you guys should check out Bitwarden. He says, I know you have reviewed and talked about password managers on the show. And he says, I'm a one password user with my family since its inception. He says, however, the idea of handing over my most precious passwords to my entire existence to a third party, regardless of encryption measures taken to protect them, always sort of rubbed me wrong. He says, I now have Bitwarden running in a Docker container on my Synology NAS using HTTPS and an SSL certificate across all my browsers, desktops, and mobile devices. He was able to import most of his one password passwords in there. Uh, and it's all just totally free and self hosted. He says you Bitwarden does offer their own hosted service. If you want to use them for that. But the cool part here is that you can run your own Bitwarden server point all your apps. And they do, they have iOS apps, on a Mac app, I think they've got apps for Windows and Linux as well. And uh, and you just point them at your local server. You can have uh, groups of passwords shared amongst multiple users on your local Bitwarden server. He actually let me log into his Bitwarden server to check it all out so I didn't have to set mine up. And man, it's cool. And the app for iOS, you can use it as like autofill like you would iCloud Keychain and or 1Password or you know LastPass or whatever. It's all right there, but... You're storing all the passwords on your local server, which is pretty darn cool. So, um, so yeah, you, this is worth checking out. I don't think they have, I'm assuming because he did it through Docker that they don't have a, um, sort of what I'll call a native Synology package yet, or no one's created one yet, but maybe someone will, because that would be even easier to implement. Although Docker's not terrible. Once you, 
once you do something with Docker, it's it's not horrible. It's just a little weird. So, um, getting the first time with Docker is definitely um, you want to leave yourself some time for frustration, and and then you once you get it, you're like, I got it. Okay. So thanks for that, David. That's pretty good. I like it. Might might be your answer there, John. Don't you think? Is John still what? there? I don't know. For your password manager. You were having some trouble with LastPass recently, weren't you? Or somebody was. Maybe it was no. somebody else who was telling me they were having trouble with LastPass. No, I'm in pretty good with them. Okay. But um, but no, the option to uh, not use someone else's cloud is uh, certainly attractive mm -hmm. if, uh, if you have something to hide. Well, I, I no, that's the wrong way to look at it. I, that that's the you know the whole I don't have anything to hide so I don't worry about what people find about me that's that leads to a path of complacency and that's not good for any of us yeah I'm kidding I know I know <laughs> I know <laughs> I just want to make sure people know like this is but it's nice as an option and I see yeah. GitHub so you know it's open source you want to look at the source code and make sure that I'm pulling a fast one that that's ah, that's a good point fun oh so, yeah uh, good call. Oh, yeah, I like it. I think I saw that somewhere on their list of features. It, it wouldn't surprise me. I hadn't dug that deep, but yeah, that yeah, that makes sense. I like it. Um, as far as browsers go, Michael says, I wanted to put in a cool stuff found candidate because I recent, recently started using the new browser from Microsoft called Microsoft Edge on my Macs. He says, I found it quite snappy, reliable, and for him, unlike Safari, in that it is not a memory or CPU hog. He says, I quite like it. It's worth giving a look. He says, Apple's a funny company. Mobile Safari is great. But Safari on the desktop, he says, is a mess. Uh, I find Safari on the desktop, I don't find it to be a mess, but I certainly find it to be a RAM hog. And I, I just make sure I have quit or quit it every day, and then I'm good to go. So, um, But there you go. So thanks, Michael. That's good. Yeah, it's that, that I remember we talked about it when the somebody sent it in when the very first like, you know, alpha release or whatever came out at the really end. I thought they were joking. So I don't no, know. I mean, we've been we talking about it Microsoft. <laughs> I mean, we talked about it on the show. Probably it was at least over the summer, maybe even last spring when the I know the very I still thought they were first. <laughs> well, but I mean, but I ran it back then. I mean, it like I've, like, I've run this. Yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah. again. Oh, mm -hmm. Come on, man. Yeah. Cool. All right, I want to take a minute and talk about our next two sponsors, the first of which is Clear. Clear makes your life safer, simpler, and more secure by using your eyes and fingertips to help you get through security faster at airports, stadiums, and other venues. Now, I am a Clear customer. In fact, I am now a paying Clear customer, and I am happy to be one. I've been using Clear for, I think, a little over a year now. And I've only been able to use it at airports. I haven't encountered a stadium where I've gone or any other venue that uses it. But man, it is so awesome at airports because I like I've said on, on the show before, when I show up, I feel like I'm a diplomat or something. You know, I get brought right to the line for the metal detector after I go through the clear process. And it's so simple. You just scan your eye or your fingerprint and Boom, you're done. Like, it's so easy and fast. And so you just get to like it. It takes a lot of the stress out of the travel process. You know, all of that, that stuff matters, you know, to be able to get to the security line where you just sort of chill and then get through and you've got time to relax for your before your flight and get, you know, maybe a sandwich or whatever. It's awesome. And enrolling is super easy. You do it online. Right. And then once you're finished online, it take, doesn't take very long, but you kind of put in all your information online and then you get to the airport. You don't have to make an appointment. In fact, I did my appointment as I was getting off a plane so that when I got on to go home, I was able to just bask and go right through. It was really easy. In fact, I got to the luggage. I did my walked off the plane, went, did my clear setup. And in that particular airport, uh, wherever I was, I got to the luggage carousel and my bags still weren't out. So that's how fast it happens. <laughs> really, really cool stuff. And they've got it now in over 65 airports. It seems like every time I travel, there's more and more uh, clear uh, availability, either in, you know, new to the airport or new to the each terminal or whatever. And it really makes life so, so much better. And uh, and you can add I've added my family to clear 
And it's great. It really makes a, a difference for all of us. It, we, we really like it. So here is the deal. I've found that clear is the best way to get through the airport security. You know, it works with pre-check too. They've they're partners with the TSA. So clear and pre-check together is like perfect. Right. And right now, listeners of Mac geek gab can get your first two months of clear for free. That's right. Because you're a Mac geek gab listener, you get your first two months of clear for free. Go to clearme.com slash Mac geek gab and use code Mac geek gab. I know that's different than the normal one we use. So you got to use this one. That's C L E A R M E dot com slash Mac geek gab code Mac geek gab. And that'll get you your free two months of clear. So check it out. And our thanks to clear for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor is ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash M G G. We've been using ExpressVPN for over a year, John. We started using it last December before we wound up going out to uh, out to CES. And man, it works great. It's fast. I've never had trouble with it on any network. It just launches and gets out and creates that secure tunnel for me. No matter where I'm traveling from, I know that nobody's sniffing my traffic. But what's even cooler is you could use it at home to get access to TV shows that are only available in other places. And this gets really cool. So you can check out like I was I was watching uh, Rick and Morty by connecting to a an endpoint in uh, in France. And then I could watch Rick and Morty on my Netflix account. It works great. You got to check it out. They they do a really nice job there. It's one click to connect. You'd use the app on the Mac, you use the app on your iPhone. You know, other platforms, of course, are available as well. And it just works. ExpressVPN.com slash M. GG is where you go. And when you use that link and you sign up, you get an extra three months of Express VPN for free. So you can support the show by using that link. Watch what you want, protect yourself, and get an extra three months of Express VPN for free at expressvpn.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Express VPN for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Perry has a question here, and this is a weird one, John. All right. So Perry um, has media sharing problems. If you go on your Mac, right, in, in, um, in Catalina, the home sharing function was moved. Uh, it used to be in iTunes and Photos preferences. Now it's been moved to the system preferences sharing pane. And it's called media sharing, where uh, it appears as an option alongside like screen sharing and file sharing and, you know, all that stuff. Right. Except for Perry, it doesn't. And this is the part that gets weird. So uh, and you see it right there. Right. If you launch system preferences, you see media sharing on yours, John. That's one of the options. Yeah, look at that. OK, huh. well, not for Perry. Perry says it's just not there. So I walked Perry through a few things. And the first was, okay, let's make sure this isn't a problem with the iCloud account. Because when I turn this on, it says, oh, you got to log in and create a home and all of that stuff. Right. So, okay, fine. No problem. Uh, I figure what we should do is create a second account on that same Mac. And log that second account. He had tried logging that second account into a different iCloud account and then turning on media sharing and it appeared. No problem. I said, great. So now we know it's not the system software on your Mac, but let's make sure it's not your iCloud account or that it is your iCloud account. So create a new temporary account on your Mac, but log it into the same iCloud account that Perry is using, uh, you know, on his main account there on the Mac. And sure enough, media sharing showed right up. So we know it's not iCloud. We know it's not the Mac, which means it's Perry's user account. Now, this is where I get stuck. And we, maybe we turn this into a geek challenge because I have no idea what would cause the user account to not show this. And I suppose 
you know, there's a couple of, it, I, I always, I always say that I approach these things from the, if I were there, what would I do next standpoint? And the problem is anything that we do next is going to start kind of messing with Perry's life outside of checking the media sharing box. The first thing that comes to mind, and I don't know if I like this better or worse than the second thing that comes to mind, but the first thing that comes to mind is sign out of Perry's iCloud account um, and sign into a different one. And I expect that not to work, but maybe that might wipe out something in iCloud's preferences and and kick it back into gear. Perry has tried signing out of iCloud and just signing back in with his same account. So we know that doesn't fix this. And I'm not sure what else to do here. We know it's something about this user account, but we don't know what. You got any thoughts, John? <sighs> Safe boot. Oh, I like that. I like that. Yeah. I mean, it could be some kernel extension thing. So, you know, that part of uh, Onyx that... um. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It just sounds like a low level thing. So, so, all right. So those, the, and then, you know, maybe when he upgraded or installed the OS, it kind of missed that part. So sure. maybe in re, doing a reinstall of the OS, which don't worry, folks, if you go into recovery and you reinstall the OS, it will not destroy everything, but it could replace or cause the system to update a corrupt or missing or uh, kernel extension. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm going here because that's something that's kind of really buried in the system here. And yeah, I, when I saw the screenshot, because I, I go to both my machines now, if I try to click on the checkbox, it won't let me, but that's because, and actually I'm not happy with the way they did the UI on this. Apparently you got to click on either home sharing or share media with guests before you can click on media sharing, which is like kind of dumb. Yeah. I don't know. Right, right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, to just it not, it, you know, it's interesting because I looked at his screen and I saw there were, I, I have like way more entries in my list here, but then I have an older machine that has <laughs> different stuff in it, like DVD or CD sharing. It's oh, like, oh, right. he probably doesn't have the hardware for or that. Bluetooth sharing or yeah, yeah I, I see several more entries, but I do see media sharing. And yeah, as you pointed out, I guess it's something new with. Yeah. Catalina, they kind of move. It's like, why'd you put it? In yeah. Why'd you do place? that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> why'd yeah. you do it? Did anybody ask you to do this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> huh. That's interesting. So, yeah, I mean, it could be time consuming to go through all those. Um, and especially safe boot. You know, last time I tried to do safe boot, I actually, uh, a lot of machines get really picky about allowing you to do a safe boot because safe boot, clears out a lot of stuff and rebuilds a lot of stuff. And it's a very useful. Sometimes I've had it fix a lot of problems. Oh, that's true. Oh, I like that. Oh yeah. Huh? Huh? I like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Clearing out all that stuff. Safe boot does a ton of stuff. Uh, Mr. Braun, you might, that's, I would, I would not have thought of that as the next thing to try, but that is a very uh, non generally non-destructive uh, step to take that might just solve these kinds of things. Huh? I like yep. it. Nice. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, I'll, link, I'll link to a little ditty about that. Okay. Okay, cool. Coolio. All right. Uh, let's move. Well, let's talk about, yeah, listener John has, um, listener John has an interesting question that I don't, I'm not sure I have the answer to this one either. Well, I'm not sure I have the answer that he wants because I don't know that the answer that he wants exists. But what John says is, we need to send audio from our soundboard at our church to a speaker that we have not yet purchased uh, in another room to allow the people over there to hear the service. He says there is Ethernet at the soundboard, but not in the room that we want to put sound in. There is Wi-Fi in the room and the room is 75 yards away 
down the hall and around a corner. Okay, so Bluetooth's out of the question, right? I'm assuming we want to do something wireless uh, because there is no cable run to this room. 75 yards is a long way to go. Um, so, you know, but but given that there's Wi-Fi there and presuming that the Wi-Fi is um, it's the same network, there, there are options for this, right? Uh, but there's not a lot of options for this. I, I took a look to see if anybody made like a Wi-Fi speaker extender kind of thing. And none of them would go this far. They're all sort of built for, I have my subwoofer in my living room or my surround speakers in my living room, but I don't want to run wires to them. So here's this thing that will send audio, you know, 20 or 30 feet, uh, full quality audio in, you know, but basically built to do in the same room, definitely not going to go 75 yards. So, you know, my, my first thought and, and well, airplay in general would be an answer here. Uh, because AirPlay does work over Wi-Fi. So you could find an AirPlay speaker, but then you'd also need to find an AirPlay transmitter, which is like an iPhone or a Mac. And this might or might not be the best slash easiest solution there. As far as I know, and I'm happy to open this up as a geek challenge. If one of you knows feedback at MacGeekab.com. But um, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't know that there's any piece of gear that would that would do this without it being attached to some other ecosystem sonos is the other thing that that i you know was thinking of and if you get you would need something to go line in for sonos so some of their speakers have a line in port um, and then once you line into it you can pair those two speakers together and you'd be good to go uh, but um, but that's, you know, that's about it. Or, or you get like a Sonos connect amp or something, you know, anything that would, um, of theirs that would, that would kind of let you connect it all together. So I don't know. What do you think, John? Uh, get a really long XLR cable from Mono Price or somebody. Um, I don't know. No, that, but I know we're looking for a wireless solution. I mean, it, well, but I, I'm not. I don't disagree with you. Wiring this may wind up being the simplest and most reliable. You know, even if you set this up with, say, Sonos or whatever or AirPlay, there's going to be probably regular opportunities where you need to sort of reconfigure the. Uh, you know, the, the wireless side, the, the speaker ecosystem side of this, it's not going to be the, just like set up once and forget about it. It, it will definitely be a thing that, um, well, remember though, that remember that the, 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 we went to this Bluetooth event uh, at CES and they were talking about this whole broadcast, um, maybe new this, broadcast mode. Yeah. But this is Bluetooth. It's not going to go 75 yeah. yards. No way. Oh, really? Okay. No way. 75 yards? Uh -uh. Okay, so that's like uh, uh types the yeah, okay. Yeah, 200 feet, right? Yeah. Or no. Some. No. Yeah, 225 plus walls. There's no way. No. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I you know, this is the um now, this is why we still see cables running all over the place. It is. Yeah. But but again, <laughs> if you get like a Sonos Connect, I mean, it's it's not going to be cheap. You know, you're, you're going to wind up spending four fifty for that. So, you know, probably sh just shy of a thousand bucks maybe to, to do this. You know, and do they have if I understand. Do they, so they have like relays so you could like jump from one to another if you needed to. With, right? with I mean, Sonos, you mean? Yes. Yeah, it, you can do well. And AirPlay 2 supports this as well. And most of all of the new Sonos components also support AirPlay 2. So there's a variety of, of ways of doing this. But um, once you have once you have sound playing on one of your Sonos speakers, you can play it on any of them in sync with that. that that's that whole multi room thing. And you can do that with AirPlay as well. Additionally, with Sonos, again, like I said, some of their devices, including the Connect and, and some of their speakers, 
have a line in port and that line in port can be this. And, and in this scenario it would have to be the source for the audio. You don't have to play that audio out of the speaker into which it is physically plugged. It can just feed the ecosystem and then you can have the sound come out of some other speaker. So yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's doable, but it, you're going to wind up needing to reset it. It's not going to be the kind of thing that you set it up once and it just stays set up that way forever. I, 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 I'm kind of with you that cable is going to be run. So uh, in, in order to, to minimize the headache, I don't know of any other, you know, what, what you really want is some device that you buy and it, it's a pair of devices one is the, you know, you plug, they both have Ethernet ports on them. They both have audio ports. One has an audio in port. The other has an audio out port. And, you know, you plug them in and you're good to go. Right. Or, or, and, and you could approximate that with, you know, with Wi Fi somehow. But I don't know, man. Like, this is, I don't know of any solutions for this, but maybe in the pro audio world, there are, you know, maybe there's something out there where somebody has solved this problem this way. So I don't know, but you start getting into weird latency issues um, with, I was going to say that with wireless. Yeah. Versus the wired, I mean, a wired solution. I mean, in theory, you're, there's some delay, but way less than it. Yeah. an RF solution. Correct. Correct. And now presumably the people in the, the room uh, that this would go to aren't able to hear the main speakers in, you know, in the, the main room. So the latency of that wouldn't be the issue. However, the the latency of this sort of thing in general would likely be the thing that keeps someone from marketing a solution like this, because, you know, you're, you're talking about a very, very, very specific use case. I, I'm not sure this exists. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, you know, just say, hey, Kate, hey, everybody, come on, sit up front. What, what are you sitting in the back? For? Well, it's not. The, no, <laughs> like sitting in the back. Actually, that's where you have to account for the the, the delays. Right. Um, because if you put and I, I forget what the what the numbers are, but it's not very, very much. If you if you've got, let's say, you know, you, you have a big crowd of people that you want to uh, reinforce the sound for. You've got a stage and you've got your speakers on that stage uh, and you want to have, you know, uh, reinforcement speakers, say, 300 feet in. You need to delay the sound that comes out of those reinforcement speakers <sighs> so that it is it is pushing that sound out when the sound from the main speakers is passing it. If you don't do that, you'll get this really weird effect that makes it even harder to hear because you've got the sound coming at you and then it'll sound like an echo following it because it's, you know, cause if it comes out of all the speakers at once, that's bad. And there's like, you can try and tune that on your own by hand, but there's computers to do that kind of tuning for you. We're sort of off the, off the trail here, but that is, you know, that's why you wouldn't necessarily have a, a wireless solution here because that latency isn't predictable. Again, in John's scenario uh, that he described, that wouldn't be an issue except it's an issue everywhere else which is why someone probably hasn't developed the solution that he wants. So, so there you go. Yeah. And yeah, if anybody knows of a solution like this, it would be interesting or, you know, my guess is it's going to be something that was built for a different purpose and that could be adapted to be used here. So, yeah. And be sure to send it to feedback at MacGeekGab.com. That is correct. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. <laughs> Steve sent something into that address this week asking about um, something that Sonos did uh, earlier this week. Sonos announced that um, uh, early last week. This is this. What is did they announce week. exactly? I think well, is what that, everybody was wondering. That's sort of the problem, right? So it, what they announced was that come May. Their old two of their old devices, the original Sonos amp, I think, and the um, the original Play 5 or Zone Player 5, if you bought it before they they rebranded the, the name of the product, would not be able to receive software updates. And this I get right. I know. I know. I, look, I own three of those original Play 5. So I am I am, you know, stuck here like the rest of you. Uh and but I, I get it. They're 14 year old speakers. Yeah. So the, companies like Apple do this, too. Like they stop 
doing software updates for older OSs, right? Correct. I, I mean, it, and, and Sonos has been really good about this. I mean, when those speakers came out, you know, lots of features that they now have didn't exist, including things like True Play, where you get to have this your phone help auto tune the speaker for the room and like all of that stuff didn't exist. And it's all been added via software, which is freaking awesome. And it's one of the things that we Sonos owners have come to love and yes, expect. So when you tell me that this speaker that you just pushed out a software update for three months ago that added, you know, some enhancement will no longer receive software updates. Yes, of course. It's like, oh, that stings, especially when replacing it. You know, those are um, the new play fives or what, like 500 bucks. So that's not cheap. So I get it. I, I was upset, too. But also it's a 14 year old speaker, you know, that is running on hardware that was specced out probably 15 years ago. Uh, and they want to do different things. In fact, there are some things that those speakers can't do like airplay too, because they don't have, I think it was enough Ram was what it turned out to be. If, if uh, that's unofficial, that's my own speculation, but I'm pretty darn sure that I think it was Ram, uh, but whatever it was, maybe it was also the CPU who knows, you know, there, there are these things that they couldn't add, and so that's already we've already seen the beginnings of this and it stands to reason that it was only going to continue and that this is not a huge surprise. Now, what the surprise was or perhaps what the insult to the injury was, is that they told customers about two options. They sent an email out to anybody that had these things in their system and said, hey, look, here it is. Come May software updates will stop for these now. That means that May will be the last software update that these will get. That's not security related. You know, it'll it, it, in terms of feature related. And they say. Because Sonos is an ecosystem, and I understand this, too. You can't have speakers on your Sonos network uh, running two different software versions because they won't work with each other. You know, they constantly are evolving things and they all need to be on the same software version. So this creates a little bit of a pickle. And they told customers about two options. One was that you could choose not to let your system get a software update that every component couldn't take, right? And what that would mean is that you would not get new features. And eventually, you might get yourself into a scenario where, you know, you start losing the ability to, say, connect to even existing audio services, if something about the audio service changes that requires a software update that, you know, you can't have, even if you have new devices, right? But if you've got these old devices, you could choose to continue using it just like you are, but not get software updates. And that might over time sort of erode your, your Sonos experience. Number two is you can take these devices off of your Sonos system and then upgrade everything else and let it stay up to date. And Sonos has a recycling program where they if you recycle one of their speakers, you get 30 uh, percent off of a new one or you could sell these speakers on your own to someone else uh, or you don't have to sell them. You could, you know, um, you could just but you could not use them on that same system and update the rest of the system. So I called Sonos and I'm like, OK, eh, you know, I don't like to jump jump the gun on anything. I don't like to jump to conclusions. I'm like, but I also know being a geek, you know, that it is possible to split your Sonos and run two separate Sonos systems on the same network. And so I called them up and I asked them, I'm like, that's still possible, right? And they're like, well, unofficially, yeah, it is. Like, okay, cool. So that could be done. They're like, right. But also, there's a third option that we didn't put in the original email to customers, but it's totally public. And we've even put it in like the stuff that we're sending out to press, which I, evidently I missed because I was having a crazy week with some family stuff. And. Uh, and they said. If customers want newer products to continue receiving updates and new features, but still want to have their older products on the network. We'll offer a way to do that. So you don't even have to do the geeky split into two separate Sonos system solution. They're like, we're going to come up with a way or we already come up with a way. They, they don't have any details to share yet, but they like by May, we will have details to share on how you can keep everything working 
What it'll mean, though, is that where you can't have speakers interacting is the multi-room listening. So they all need to be on the same software version for that. So if you choose this path or you choose my geeky path of, you know, creating two separate Sonos systems, they're not going to do the multi-room listening. But other than that, you're fine. And for a lot of folks, multi-room listening, especially if you choose strategically where to place your speakers, you might not care about having one speaker or two speakers or like me, three speakers that can't participate in that with the others. And you can set it up that way and then, you know, maybe you'll be all right. They they don't have a whole lot of details on that, but that's certainly one of the things that I would expect would not be, a, a you know, not be able to work. Uh, but I don't know why they didn't send this to customers in the first email, because it caused a meltdown on the Internet. And uh, and I was busy writing the article about, you know, OK, so this is what can happen. And then Sonos did it better than me because they emailed everybody again and said, hey, there's also this third option that we'll tell you more about in May, but don't worry, we've got you. I was like, okay, great. So I don't want to say it was much ado about nothing, but it certainly blew up and led people to believe things were much worse than they actually are. And to be fair, like when the verge posted their story, they included this third option. in it. No one saw it because no one, everybody read the email that Sonos sent to them, not what someone else was saying. And thankfully, Sonos realized that and just sent out a better email. So, or a, a, a follow up email. So, I, you know, there you go. It, did that make sense, John? Yeah, I think so. The thing is, yeah, the, the, uh, the media <clears throat> or some media or some people interpreted it as you can't use your old stuff anymore. That, because that's basically that's, what the first email said. I mean, I mean, not in so many words, but. But that's basically the message was, yeah, but they, but, but they didn't explicitly offer the third, you know, Correct. off the record. Yeah, but it wasn't <laughs> off the record. That was the that was the part that was weird. Or maybe uh, people chose not to read that part. And no, just it wasn't there. The, it wasn't in okay. the email, but it, it was. It All right. Was, so, so for for experienced Sonos users, you kind of knew that this was possible, right? As a no, I didn't because it's not oh, yet possible. Right. This is a new oh, thing that they're going to okay, offer. Okay. I knew that as a geek, I could like hack together a solution where I had essentially two separate Sonos networks running, you know, at my house. Um, and they put it in the press release, but they didn't put it in the email that they sent to, their first email that they oh, sent okay. to customers, which is why it got so confused. Yeah. But thankfully, they they fixed it and, you know, sent the email out and everybody was happy. Everybody was like, oh, this isn't as bad as we thought. So I don't think this was their strategy to get people mm -hmm. all bent out of shape and then tell them, no, we have an answer for you. Uh, I, I, I think they probably just wanted to keep it simple and not share details about this thing that they they don't have details about yet, but quite, you know, correctly realized, oh, no, we need to we need to tell people that something. So, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. But it was there all the way through. This wasn't like a change. Mm -hmm. That's the part that. Yeah, that's the part that was weird when they said, well, it was in the press release. I'm like, oh, OK. Well, I, like I said, yeah. I haven't read the press release. It's been a busy week. So, yeah, just anyway. the fact that they've been running their let's call it version one product line for so long. Um, 14, you know, years. you said, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, it's crazy. I mean, it's crazy. It's like my MacBook pro. I mean, that's crazy too. Yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about that? Cause uh, let's talk about that. So John, you're thinking about getting a new MacBook pro. You're going to get one of these 16 inch ones, aren't you? I think so because, so here's what's happening now. So I have the MacBook Pro mid-2012, 15-inch, the last of the user-replaceable Macs. And that's a fact. Don't fight me on this. Okay. <laughs> no, in that you can replace, yeah. you, you can, the user can replace the RAM, the battery, and the hard drive. Sure. With nothing more than a screwdriver, um, maybe a couple of different screwdrivers. Yeah. But um, here's the thing that's been happening as of late. So I bought a new battery for my fix it and it's working good. I, I bought a cheap knockoff and, and it like died like within a year. Sure. So, so I got a new battery, but then I'm starting to run into it. I don't know. It, it had a minor fall on carpet and stuff. So I don't know if something just shook loose or whatever, but now what's happening is that when I put it to sleep, which I think is what most people do when they're not using their machine, especially their portable. So I put it to sleep. The thing is, it, fa it consistently fails in that when I come to the machine in the morning, it's off. 
No, it's not sleeping. The, the LED is not pulsing. It's off. And I hit the power button and it's restarting and loading the image from RAM. And then it comes up and says uh, EFI, uh, something like EFI fault sleep wake failure. Yeah, EFI related sleep wake failure. That's not good. And if you search for this term, you'll find it online. I'm not the only one, but to me, there's something, something going. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, you know what? And and you and I, you know, when we were out in Vegas, there we went to that store, and you know, we were checking out this. And the 16 inch looks. Uh, the prior models made me nervous, especially because the keyboards were garbage or on a lot of them were garbage. Right. And there were all these recalls and, you know, repair programs and stuff like that. And I'm like, I don't want that. So but the gar- feedback garbage I, is it, yeah, maybe that's too strong. Well, no, 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 no. It, it, some people more agree. faulty than most. <laughs> it, well, there's that's the thing is there's two issues with the butterfly keyboard. One is that some people just don't like it. And a lot of people do like it, but but a lot of people don't like it. Just personal preference. And then they've had a lot of issues with it, which at this point they've sussed out. I I think we've gotten the butterfly keyboards to the point of reliability. They keep changing it. In fact, when they swapped mine out in my MacBook Air at six months of age or something, they put in the new design with the, the extra film in there and all of that stuff. So I, I think they've gotten it there, but, you know, time will tell. So. So the 16 inch looks like the class of machine that I want. And uh, yeah, I, doesn't surprise I mean, me as far either. as the buying decision, I mean, I looked. And so if you go to their page, you'll see two. They offer up two there. You know, the one on the right, I think, is what I want, Dave. Yeah. So it's a 2.3 gigahertz, eight core processor, one terabyte storage, eight uh, uh, Radeon 5500. So the processor is probably way more than I need. It's it's definitely it, it's like at least twice the processor in this machine, if not more. Right. I mean, oh, this has I, a two point seven gig four core, I think, and the, it's an i five or i seven. And the, yeah. So, anyways, the processor is crazy on this. And has it the, goes up has to four point eight. Has Tracker been updated with the new Pro? I don't think so. So I don't know. Well, we can look at Geekbench scores, right? Um, yeah. But the anyways, the processor looks fine. And, you know, it's got a, you know, hefty, you know, a better uh, GPU. The, the, the two points the, or the two parameters that I was looking at. So I'd really like to have 16 gigs of RAM. I may not need it, but I want it. And I, then I'm with you on that. I, I we don't need it. I've I've in fact proven to myself that I don't need it, but I would still buy a machine with it. So there you go. Yeah. Right. And then. The built-in SSD is one terabyte, which is what I have right now with my crucial SSD. So I'm like, yeah, that that meets my needs. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, your multi-core speed on the i9 eight core. That's what you're talking about, right? The the yes the eight core i9. The multi-core speed on that one is right about seven thousand. Uh, if I'm browsing Geekbench results, so um. You know that the, where does your where does your current one what what MacBook Pro do you say you have the 2012 mid 2012 15 inch? Correct. Pre Retina, right? Yes, exactly. Because the Retina, I think, was the first model that I think you the, the battery was not replaceable. So they started that was the machine that started going down the path of don't touch this. So this is interesting. <laughs> Seven thousand is really low. Huh. I don't know. I mean, like ridiculously low. I don't know if maybe we're not comparing apples to apples here because uh, yours, uh, yours clocks in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yours clocks in at like somewhere in the 11,000 range. And this one, it doesn't make sense that, that it's only 7,000 on the, it's, a, it's gotta be two different scales. Uh-huh. Um, because yeah. That, so this has a 2.3 gigahertz quad core I seven in this machine, which is decent. You know, okay. So that, what I need. That is a four core i7. So on these geek branch results, just to comp- so that we are comparing apples to apples, like I said, 7,000 for the 16 inch MacBook Pro for your machine, 2,800. So that makes more sense that it's mm-hmm. essentially, you know, a little more than what, two and a half times the, the speed. So, yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. That, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, and, and you'll get a, a retina screen, which you've never had, right? You don't even have one on your on your desktop 
Well, you don't I have, have it on my problem. iPhone. Oh, that's right. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It. I will tell you, it is different when it is big. <laughs> It, um, you'll like that for sure. Yeah. yeah. And the touch bar and the touch ID, that's, that's a welcome thing. The only thing, you know, I mean, the cringe we're through, and that actually I've been looking on Amazon, um, though I may want to go to OWC because I believe you did mention that they do make some nice stocks, but I think just for the, the purpose of data transfer, I may want something more tuned to just, I just want something that gives me a USB port. So I can import my data from my my backup. <laughs> oh, like a, in that a case, USB, I don't a USB A port. Uh, uh, so I do my backups right now to a, a yes a, a SSD with a USB A port. So okay. so I need an adapter that gives me at least that. Now Apple does sell one, but there are also some like pre hundred uh, sub hundred dollar things that I found on Amazon that'll give me. A basic set of ports. Don't buy cheap crap docs. Let me tell you, seriously. Well, that's people, the thing is that I'm looking at them and some get like shaky ratings. And and I mean, you and I both know that o- OWC makes total well, quality stuff. So and, what, and, what OWC you, and, and some others, but certainly OWC does, is they make sure that they put enough USB buses in their various docs. Uh, to ensure that you can get full throughput on all your USB ports simultaneously. And right. and they make sure that power is passed the right way. Like you definitely, and again, OWC is not the only company that does this. There are, there are many others, but you want to make sure you're not just getting some, you know, unknown crummy dock. But if you're looking for a USB-C dock, you can get quality stuff in like the $50 range. I mean, depending on how many ports you want, you might wind up spending, you know, upwards of a hundred. But if you're getting a dock for your desk, I would think about getting a Thunderbolt dock so that you've got, you know, more. I mean, it depends. Like I have several. What was the one that you used when we were at max stock? So that that like saved the day because you you were missing some connectivity that this uh but, but which one was that? Oh, well, I mean I I Anchor is is one of the ones that okay. I travel with. Um and that dock is is good. Um I have the uh, I forget which the, the model name is, but it's the little thin one that has three USB and HDMI and an ethernet on it. Uh, so that one works well. But I I now travel with the OWC USB C dock, and I think that's what $30, okay. thirty nine dollars or something, right? I mean, it's, oh, all right. Yeah. I mean, all I really need for data migration is a USB port. And again, Apple makes something, but I may want something. I'm going to stop you again and correct you. You need a USB A port because your computer is going to yes. have four USB correct. ports. They are USB C ports. Yes, I need USB A to talk to my right. Yeah, backup. Right. Right. Other than that, I mean, you know, I've seen uh, there are a batch of things that have HDMI and SD and Ethernet and stuff. And I may use those on occasion, but sure, I just want to bring over my data. That's all I want to do. Yeah, right. Right. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, getting the machine. I mean, otherwise I can't. Imp- well, I could import my old data from. A no, you're, you're going to want to have backup. you're going to want to have USB A ports somehow yes. for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Y- yeah. The y- other ports, that's uh, I, I'll continue to do research so that's yeah that's my process man yeah and then when i went to the apple site so first off apple is like hey you know what we got a recycling program and i'm like oh really and they're like yeah put in your serial number of your ancient machine and they're like okay does it work does it turn on um and uh they're like uh, yeah we'll give you 250 for it i'm like really <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then if i put it on my apple card i get three percent so so that'll knock a few bucks off of it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right. Well, I put a link in the show notes to that. It's a new version of it. I actually don't have the one that's in there, but uh, I have it, one that looks and is laid out very similar to that from Anchor. And then, um, and then I'll put a link to the the other world computing uh, USB C travel dock because that. Yeah, but it's actually nice that they'll take it back. <laughs> oh yeah, to take your computer back? Sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, it just worries me. I mean, our town does have electronics recycling, but which actually works fine. I mean, I, you know, drive in and I'm like, I hear for recycling and I put it in a tractor trailer and yeah. I don't know what happens after that. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, of course. Of course. 
because I know for neither of these machines. So my 2012 and then my, my uh, what's my Mac Mini 2014? I'm not going to get any serious dollars, but yeah, right? uh, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure, yeah, yeah. All right. Oh well, thanks for the uh, yeah, thanks. Travel doc. That's that's the term I was I, looking that's for. A, I I you know so I did find like I said I found the the upgraded version of the anchor one I have that's thirty two bucks I think thirty three maybe the OWC one is fifty five. It is a better dock and it's got the um the 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 uh, SD card reader on it too if you want and I think it'll pass power which is a handy thing to have while you travel so you might you might like that um, so, yes yeah so anyway it, but yes USB C docks can be had great ones can be had for well under a hundred bucks um, generally about half that it's it's mm, especially nice. the travel docks. Yeah, it it's where and, and again, you know, for your laptop, you might you might not need a um a a dock at your desk. Um you might just need the travel dock. But I will say this, because you now will be in USB-C land, you have the ability to have lots of different charging options. So you might like the idea of getting a more permanent uh, dock for wherever you use your your laptop most so that you can just plug in and you get power and Ethernet like this really does finally reach, you know, the Steve Jobs vision of one cable for your computer. Right. Because like when I plug in, really, my son is a better example than me because he has his laptop on his desk and he's got the OWC Thunderbolt three dock there and he plugs that in. And now he has, you know, a bunch of USB A ports. He's got extra Thunderbolt ports. He's got a uh, display for a monitor. He's got Ethernet and power all coming across the same uh, the same bus, which is really handy. And then that way now you can leave your power adapter in your bag so that you, you know, you've got that when you need to uh, on the go or whatever, or you could buy a gallium nitride power adapter that's lighter and can fit in your bag. And, you know, there's lots of options. You don't, you're no longer hamstrung by the MagSafe port in that you have to buy your power adapters from Apple or, you know, accept the consequences. There's lots of people making power delivery uh, devices, including batteries, Right. Like I've got a couple of batteries right. that I can use for my laptop on the go, which is amazing. So that's something we weren't able to do before. So it is good. It is good. Yeah. Well, I guess Apple, a lot of Apple's latest stuff. I mean, what is it? Latest iPad has USB-C, right? It does. So. Yeah. So it can take power delivery, too. That's right. So yeah. it sounds like they're. So are we going to see an iPhone with USB-C? Um, I, you know, I, I think someday. Yes. Um, the, the USB C port is a little thicker than the lightning port. So that m alone might be the reason that we don't. Um, but I, I think there's potentially a world where we do. Yeah. 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 So yeah, we'll I'll just have to see what happens. Well, it sounds like they're moving in that direction. It's funny because I've been hearing chatter among, uh, various countries that would like, certain technology companies to kind of standardize on one charging, which I got to so say. So you're talking maybe? about what's happening in Europe. I mean, I don't want to say some countries. I want to say Europe. Yes, because that's what. Yeah. You're so the about, EU, right? I think, okay. is is considering enforcing or, or suggesting that everybody standardize on one connector. Now, you know, in this day and age, you know, micro USB is probably it for non Apple people. Right. Either micro USB. I, I mean, I think if if. You were going to make that decision today. I think you would choose USB C instead of micro USB. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but I'm saying currently, I think uh, uh, on the other side of the fence, it's it's. Uh, well, I think if, I think they would choose USB C today. I think five years ago they would have chosen micro USB, and I think right. that's the problem with with it, that sort of you know mandated thing is you will naturally choose. The most popular, you know, uh, I don't want to say bleeding edge, but, you know, cutting edge technology so that y'all were getting the right thing in place for everybody. But I'm not convinced that that's smart. I mean, I think that's going to wind up with a scenario. If we had chosen, if we had done this five years ago, we would have chosen micro USB. And like those connectors were 
were crap. They fall apart all the time. So that like that might have caused mm -hmm. more waste, not less. I don't know. Right, I don't know right. that there's a there's a good answer here. This is this is not an easy. It seems like an easy idea, but it, it, it in implementation. And, and of course, you know, their hearts seem to be in the right places, at least on the surface. But I don't I'm not convinced that that there's that this is a, a smart move it, when you stop and take a breath and think about it. I, I think I think you wind up with with inferior tech being mandated and mm. and i don't it doesn't seem like a good idea no i could see that view on the other hand i'm just thinking you know i mean at least you know in most countries you have one standard for what's in the wall you know? are we talking about what's in the wall or what's in my device because that's two very uh, different things oh well we're, yes we, we are uh, what i'm saying is that what's in the wall you know, at least in this, you know, so we got 120 volt, 60 cycle electricity. That's that's the standard. You know, you don't have another standard for providing power to your devices in your house. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right. But, but I have. Well, but I do. I mean, most of my devices are DC devices, so they need to run through a, a transformer. Yes. And yes. and those DC devices actually are more universal than even my house. So, right. So I think what you're saying is that, yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it, it's a more diverse universe with portable devices. Yeah. But yeah. I, I'm just saying, yeah, US, I, I don't know. I mean, USB-C sounds like it may be the way for everybody to go. I mean, it's kind of getting there, but, but even but again, Apple are, is fragmented. Are right we now. talking about on the device or on the charger? Because that's two very different things. If you're saying all chargers have to be, say, USB-C. OK, well, then I could still have lightning on my device. I just get a USB-C to lightning cable. No problem. But if you're saying that the devices all need to be USB-C, now you're you're mandating how the device can work. I don't you know, I don't I, I feel like that might stagnate technology. I'm not I'm not convinced that that's okay. a good idea. I think we might again, I think we we might want we might wind up with a scenario where we're we're forced to use something inferior. We're stifling any innovation. Um, I mean, the market has sorted it out already, right? I mean, people go up in arms anytime somebody changes a, a power connector, you know, so people like mm -hmm. companies are resistant to that until they're like, well, we got to bite the bullet because it's the it, it is the best way to go. So they they make that choice. But it's not without, you know, a lot of thought. I, I don't think any major tech companies are doing this without really thinking it through. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. Well, we've outrun our time here today. I want to thank you so much for spending your time with us. We will do this again next week because that's how we roll here. It's, you know, it's kind of what we do. I want to thank our sponsors. Of course, clearme.com slash MacGeekGab, expressvpn.com slash MGG, MacSales.com and Linode.com slash MGG. It's all our sponsors for this episode. Of course, I want to thank all of you because without you, there's really no reason for us. To, I mean, John and I would still chat and get together and, you know, dissect tech, but we wouldn't record it for maybe, maybe for posterity. We would, but it's better doing it this way. It's way better. So thank you. We really appreciate you listening. Appreciate you sending in all your stuff. We appreciate those of you that are premium listeners, premium uh, or MacGeekUp.com slash premium is where you would want to go. It is good stuff to have you, and we are stoked. So make sure you uh, subscribe to our email newsletter at MacGeekUp.com so that you can get all the show notes sent to you uh, as soon as the show's out. Well, really, it's we send them out once a day at 8 a.m. Eastern, and uh, so they you know, they're, they're out within 20. They're in your inbox within 24 hours of the show being published, usually much sooner. But sometimes, you know, it's a little closer to the mark. But anyway, we appreciate it. We uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. John, if uh, if you had one thing to say to these people now, I want you to take a minute and think about this because this is this is important. Right. We've used a lot of their time. Hopefully we've both entertained and informed so that's that's the goal hopefully everybody's learned at least five new things i know i have so with all of that in place what's 
one last thing you might want to ensure everyone remembers. Well, Dave, if you're insisting on not three, not two, but one thing, then the one thing I can say is don't get caught. Made up.